Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Hancock and this is the Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. We have Anne-Marie Puente from Grayston Bakery with us today to talk about open hiring practices. Um, I'd like to uh, first introduce Michael Pearson who's um, uh, organized our Humanistic Management Association. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Anne Marie, for doing this. Thank you, everybody, for being for being on the call. Uh, and so, I have not much to say other than uh, thank you, Jennifer, for for organizing this, this particular format. The organization, the Humanistic Management Association, is trying to shift the the conversation about how we manage well, and it has two pillars: the protection of dignity and the promotion of well-being. And I think there's. Uh, almost no better example than the open hiring model that Anne-Marie will sort of uh, share more about today. So uh, thanks for all uh, for all to, to, to be participating in this conversation and hope for more. So thanks. Um, the International Humanistic Management Association, we have uh, groups of academics, groups of professionals, and we'd like to reach out also to policymakers and we host you know, uh, conferences and webinars and conversations online about topics of interest to people who want to change how we do business. Now, Elizabeth Castillo is managing our chat room, um, and I'm going to have her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Castillo from Arizona State University. I will be moderating the chat. So whatever questions you have for Emory, just type them into the chat and we will ask them after the presentation is over. Great. All right. So let me introduce our guest today. It's Anne-Marie Puente from the uh, Center for Open Hiring, which is associated with Grayston Bakery. Um, Anne-Marie, if you can introduce yourself and spend a few minutes talking about open hiring practices. Yeah, sure. Thank you guys. Um, proud to be here and happy to really um, be part of the Humanistic Management Network. So this is a fantastic opportunity. So just as background, um, um, just want to let you guys know that as a background as an attorney and um, very interested in human rights, so social um, social justice issues, um, and um, even um, um, was an employment lawyer as well. A lot of these issues really interested me, but it's kind of uh, realized when you're suing people, you're not really getting the really heart of the problem. So I started studying design, and that was the reason why to look at systems design, to work with many different actors who are re-looking at how things start from the very beginning. And so I um, had a master's in um, design management and then really started looking into that and using those skills, design thinking, to rethink a lot of these systems. As a result of that, um, teaching at Parsons School of Design and the same type of things in terms of social innovation and helping students um, understand those those two of business and also social um, justice. And that led me to the Grayston and the Center for Open Hiring. What they're trying to do, it's a very new initiative. Um, at Grayston, we have a bakery, but we also have um, the nonprofit arm, which is Grayston Foundation. And the foundation actually owns um, Grayston Bakery. So it's a very interested, um, in, uh, very interesting hybrid social enterprise. And so with that, part of this um, really big interest that the CEO was seeing in open hiring and for other organizations to adopt a lot of these practices, he started the Center for Open Hiring. So it is a very new initiative. And so part of that is to have a research and development aspect about that, to have an education and training to really build that out to help other organizations, uh, whether it is a business or even an academic institution, understand open hiring and be able to practice it or also advising, you know, coaching organizations along this, along these practices. So I think when I realized a lot of the questions of what we were receiving, either people didn't understand open hiring, and I'll go into that, or they didn't understand really the reason we're, we really started this kind of initiative to understand our practices deeper and to develop, for example, a very um, robust impact measurement system. So just now starting to measure a lot of the things that probably were not measured. Um, so that's something really important to keep in mind that this is still a very new initiative and a very much like a little startup. So open hiring is exactly what it is. We open our doors, uh, people walk to the bakery and they sign their name on a list. And when there is a position available, depending on production needs, um, people are called and ask, do you still want to work here? And people come in and as long as they can meet a few requirements, which is we're able to work a 12 hour shift, they're able to lift at least 50 pounds, usually no more than 50, and that they can fill out an I-9 form, 
right, which is one of these requirements. But other than that, we don't look at anything else, and um, people are very surprised when they come in, and the first thing that they fill out are forms to be, to be paid, right, and during the orientation. And they sit there and they have an orientation on general manufacturing practices, an orientation on our culture, on the expectations, and then they get to decide if they want to work with us. So we also still, even at the orientation stage, don't force them to work. We tell them this is what it is, this is the kind of environment we have, this kind of culture, and can you start working in two days? Because it's usually that quick of a turnaround. So that's basically the essence of how they enter into the open hiring um, system yeah, journey. And um, from there, they go through an apprenticeship, which usually lasts between um, seven to 10 months, depending on attendance. And then from the, after the apprenticeship, they get training on soft skills, hard skills. They then become a full-time employee and they get benefits, um, health insurance, um, life insurance, and access to our learning development training, which we are now doing a robust training on that as well, and um, become a full-fledged employee. We have something called Mandela Day that we have all the employees come together and we you know, learn about each other and we kind of reintegrate in our processes. So they really become part of a community of a workplace. And um, so kind of that's that whole journey of just entering, non-judgment, no questions asked, and then really that apprenticeship, that training, um, which has you know, really been the, the really amazing point of like critical peer-to-peer -peer relationships are developed and they're able to you know, just be who they need to be during that time. And then that next stage of becoming a full-time employee and being part of a bigger, a bigger um, um, part of that you know, ecosystem of work here at Grayston. That's a short synopsis. Uh, Jen, I don't know if you want me to jump in on questions, or um, I feel like sometimes this is the time where people have really meaty questions, and we're happy to dive into that. Right. Well, what I'd like to do is start with a couple of questions for me and Elizabeth, and then kind of expand to everyone else. Um, we had talked earlier about how this kind of mirrors a volunteer management, where you do the recruitment in, you bring them in as a group, you give them an orient orientation, and you let them self-select out if they're not if they don't think they'd be a fit and then you start training them and having them working and then there's a there's a period of time where they're still temp conditional based on the training and then if they complete that they're they become full-time employees now are they paid for the the in, is it an internship apprenticeship apprenticeship yes yes they are paid yes yes so for even all the intents and purposes, day, on the day first day of orientation, even if they say this is not for me, I don't, you know, because a lot of times people sign up and they don't know that it's what it really entails. They're still paid for the first day of orientation. Very cool. Now, how many people complete the apprenticeship, like percentage wise? Yeah, percentage wise, usually it's about about um, the turnovers. I think my we last update was sixty seven percent. So it's seems to be um, that people do drop out only because it's really difficult to understand the reasons why people sign the list. We're even looking into research on that. A lot of times in the community, your probation officer, by, by, just by being on probation, you have to start looking for jobs. And so they force you to do certain things to make sure that you're you know, keeping on tap with that. So a lot of times people aren't really committed. And that's kind of the main thing, that people who come to Grayson and want that opportunity, and then we give them that opportunity to complete the questions asked, you have to be ready for the opportunity to work. Because at the end of the day, it is a workplace. And um, so that's something really important to keep in mind. Now, I work with a lot of HR professionals, and they're gonna hear that high turnover rate, and they're gonna think that's expensive. Like, I've just brought these people in, it cost me money to bring them in, why, you know, is this really a good alternative to the normal hiring process where we interview and we vet and we do all that stuff? How do you guys deal with this? Because you are a working bakery. It's not like you don't produce gazillions of brownies for. Yep. So, um, so the no, no, no cost, really. Um, the kind of the general numbers of that is it cost from last I heard uh, $4,000 to on average for each person in terms of traditional HR practice, whether by the time you interview people, you review resumes and you do background checks, you do drug testing, we're saying don't do that. So on average in Grayston, it's been about $2,000 in terms of if you really price that out um, and it becomes a process, right? That you actually know how to 
you know, have people come in in orientation and you're not spending that money at that front end of interviewing and that's really the money that gets spent, right? And then you're having a bigger group at an orientation, you know, not money is spent in that either because you already have those tools and the training to have an orientation for a number of people, right? And so that's why it becomes a little bit, the costs are shifted rather than kind of screening people out, you're more, you know, it's the, the training becomes something that's already embedded in part of the process of the workplace. Okay. And how, the other big question when I was, I was in an HR conference last month and when I mentioned this to people, they said, liability, what do you mean you don't do drug testing? <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. Can you address that part of just letting anybody walk in off the street and work for you part of that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I think what's an interesting thing is that what, um, what, what's, what we've been noticing is that, you know, when you do just what you were saying, a, a process that actually has a self-selection, right? When you see have people come in and you say, these are the requirements of the job. You have to have a 12-hour shift. You have to be here at a certain time. You have to, you know, um, abide by general manufacturing, you know, procedures. There's all these different rules in place. And then when people realize it's an actual workplace, then people start leaving. And they, even after the orientation, they probably realize this is not for me. And that's okay. And that's exactly what this point is that you're, if someone is intending to do something that is going to be contrary to the workplace, they probably are not going to stay there because it's going to be too much work to do that. And not that being said, we haven't had issues, legal issues like that. Like I think people would say negligent hiring claim. We haven't had those um, to my, and since we've been here, since they've been tracking that and since uh, the CEO has been here as well. So that's something that hasn't happened. And we actually think because usually when you have a negligent hiring, negligent supervision, negligent retention, there is that piece of you're not actually supervising people in the in, in once you get people into your in, in the workplace in the bakery, they have these. Can you I, start can you follow. repeat that because you kind of froze for a little bit and we lost about three seconds of that. So can you repeat what sure. you were saying about the negligent hiring? Sure. That um, with negligent hiring, you have negligent supervision and negligent retention claims. So a lot of times the, I would say that in our position, since we supervise people very, you know, that we have the supervision there, we have the care that we have for them there, that those, we haven't had those claims since we've been doing, since they've been tracking those, that data. And how long have they question? been tracking data? Because I know you guys hire people off the street, you bring in people with drug problems, you bring in people with prior convictions or, you know, uh, released from yep. jail. Um, how long have you been tracking, <laughs> tracking this? Yeah, so um, according to the information that I've been given, and that's been from the board of directors that they collect, you know, obviously lawsuits and these type of, um, any kind of claims, their, to their knowledge, and that, that we've been, that we haven't had any of those, suits, those lawsuits, if that's the question. There, and again, I think that's something to remember is that here it's 100% open hiring, and that's probably the reason why, and that even just, it's actually about a third of our workforce, it's probably a, a we would say, you know, formerly incarcerated involvement with the justice system. So I think that's also important to remember that it is still a diverse group. It could be individuals who just don't have uh, work experience, who've been out of the workforce, who don't have an education, and they just, you know, want to work at Grayston for whatever reason. So that's also important to remember that it's not a bunch of people who are, you know, just released from, you know, um, from, from, you know, from being in jail. So for an employer, is this the sort of thing that can be done? Is this only for entry level work? Does everybody come in and they start at entry level or can this be done at higher levels or, you know, can you speak to that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that's something I'm, I'm curious to hear about the group, what they think about that. But for right now, it is entry level positions that are happening at Grayson. And with our, some of the pilot partners that we have, it's also very similar industries in terms of manufacturing and other entry level positions, um, Clean Craft, um, which is a company that is recently, I think that was part of our Fast Company article recently, um, and they're a um, cleaning company. So they're also looking also for being one of the pilots of, of open hiring as well. And if, if people with companies are looking to maybe do an experiment with open hiring, should they contact the Center for Open Hiring? 
Yes, I think that's I think that's a great idea. I think kind of this initial stage of they want to implement. I think that having that conversation and education on the philosophy of the practices and what actually how we do it and more in depth. I think it's something that would we definitely we're, we're doing that every day and we would love to do that even more. And part of that's the part of the idea of the center that we learn from our pilots and see what works and have the ability to have a, a co relationship with other companies to research that. And if they only want to do one position, then we help you build that infrastructure to create that. Because an important piece of the open hiring piece is that we have um, social support services for the individuals who come in just in case they need it. Um, and not everyone does need it. So I think that's also important to remember. And so having that relationship that we have with our, um, our partnerships in the local community, which is the social services, have someone on site to really help with any issues that might come arise. And that's also probably what leads to none of the major issues that people might think that they would have that with this type of um, hiring practice. Uh, something that would be similar to employee assistance program is very similar to that. If anyone has an issue, they would go to this um, social service provider who is on site to help people immediately with any issues. Elizabeth, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? I do have a question, um, Anne-Marie. Um, it's clear the benefits for the employees, um, and it's also clear that this is helping you fulfill your social mission. But as an operating business, do you see any advantages uh, as it, from the employer perspective of, of, of hire, this hiring model? Yeah, I mean, I do. I think even with a lot of states doing ban the box, um, a lot of lawyers have been saying that it's a very cumbersome process for their um, for their clients, and it, it does it is it becomes if you if you guys have been studying that, which I'm sure you guys have been, you have to prove you have to make a case of why you didn't hire somebody, even you know if you found something that did have, for example, you know a path that you weren't really comfortable with, and so kind of if you're able to shift those costs and even that cumbersome for like having a more robust orientation process. That's, that's at the end, that's all we're trying to inspire people to do, to have a more open process rather than screening people out immediately that you can say, look, we're going to have a, a mechanism that is more broad that we can have, we can really bring people in in the community, probably wouldn't have a chance, and then see how that um, process goes from there. Because at the end of the day, most of the individuals who are wanting to find work and wanting to be part of a community want to work and they want to be given that second chance. And I think that's the idea that we're trying to really push here is to help bust a lot of these myths that, you know, once people, you know, have had a past and they're trying to move on, then they should be given a chance to really um, just have an open door to an opportunity to work. Have you found that it helped with uh, long-term retention for like employees who appreciated the opportunity and so they've wanted to just be dedicated and move up within the company? Yeah, so that's also a really good point. That's, um, that is one of the main advantages of having open hiring. When you give people a chance and you say, look, we're not gonna look at your past. We're gonna really look at what you know, the potential you have here. and We're gonna believe in that potential. People step up to that. And I think that is something, you know, we're looking at, you know, looking at researchers to probably help with that, that there's a psychological aspect of that. When you write, raise a standard for people and to say, look, we, we, we trust you. We're, you know, this is the expectation here, and we know that you can move up to that, and people do. And because of that, people are really loyal to the company, and they really are devoted to just being here and being part of the family. It's been described a lot as, as being a family at Grayson, especially at the bakery, because especially it's very community-oriented, and a lot of people know each other, and so they really uh, want to make sure that people succeed, and whether it's getting to the apprenticeship or staying in full-time employment, should that, that's something to be interested in. So yes, that's definitely one of the major benefits. Um, it seems to me that this open hiring, you, you know, you, you, people sign up, they say they want a job, you don't discriminate, you bring them in for an orientation, see if they're still interested. This should have a positive impact on diversity in the workforce, right? Yes, yes, definitely. I think that when you open your doors to everybody, I think you, that definitely becomes part of this diversity and inclusion um, conversation. And I think that's a lot of times even um, looking at, and I'm sure everyone knows this as well, being an HR professional, looking at how you describe the position of a job, right? You know, even having something as an MBA on a job description, it's a barrier for individuals who don't have an MBA, but they could probably do an accounting job. So very similar, um, in a similar manner, having at the bakery, 
even having something you need a high school diploma, right? When you just really need someone to probably read and you need someone to do, you know, just to work for 12 hours and, and this type of thinking of how to really, you know, look at the positions you have and really just start to hire for what exactly you need and then you can open those doors. So a great position that we've been trying to really help with companies who probably aren't manufacturing companies, but are just regular huge global companies are the mailroom, right? The mailroom um, necessarily probably would need, you know, very complex, you know, degrees or um, a high level of knowledge. That could be a really good starting point for an open hiring position. Um, Elizabeth, do we want to open it up to questions from the chat room? Yes, we do have some questions, so we'll go ahead and start with those. Um, so Crystal asks, um, is that a minimum wage for orientation and then they go to a higher rate if they decide to actually come on board? And then are the staffing agencies used to direct people to you? So yes, it is a minimum wage when they start and uh, we just re recently did a uh, living wage analysis there and so when they become full-time employees, they get about, it's approximately a little over $20 an hour with the benefits of health benefits, um, learning and development benefits, and um, they also get pay increases when there's attendance, good attendance quarterly, they get also increases. So it, it rounds about, about $20 an hour, which is not bad for, with the exclusive all the benefits. In addition to having the social service coordinator also on staff, that includes that number as well. And we don't work with staffing agencies actually, and that's been kind of this interesting thing of how do people know, and we're looking at probably researching that, how do people find out about the bakery? Because we don't do any marketing about that there's a list that you can just sign your name. Um, so that's an interesting thing, but I, uh, we do know that probation officers sometimes refer individuals there as well, but again, if people are being referred but have no intention to actually work there, that, you know, that's, that's why it affects a lot of the numbers of the people who sign up and then try to start at orientation. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, the next question is from Florian, who wants to know, um, since you don't hire people based on their character or previous experience, how do you make sure that you have a good mix of personalities on your team and overall good team cohesion? That's a great question. And this is why we have the, the apprenticeship training to have a really, I would say just holistic model of how to engage in and develop people. Our the head of HR at um, Grayson, he talks about this at, at the end of the day, that's what his job is, and he says all HR professionals that they just want to help individuals succeed. And that the management there is about paying attention to individual needs, right? And that should be every HR um, top goal. And that's exactly what happens at Grayson. Um, that if there are, you know, any kind of regular conflicts that would be in any office, it's probably the same that would also be at Grayson. So, and then we deal with it the same way, right? So people come in with the expectation and they, um, that when they all the orientation that this is very team oriented um, atmosphere. And so getting along in the team, you have to, it has to, it has to work. And so that becomes fit. And then when people realize this is not for me because I can't probably work on a team, they naturally, you know, they just don't show up because there's no penalty for not showing up in that, in that way. And that's kind of this idea that we have path making that we can't tell you that the path that you're meant to be on. So individuals either choose to be here at the bakery or if they decide to leave. Um, that's something that we also, is, it's a really big point at Grayson to not be that we, we spent so much time training them and we're going to be really disappointed if they leave. It's, um, this retention argument that a lot of people use. I'd like to, to follow up on that. Um, you know, your onboarding process really does remind me of volunteer management onboarding where you allow people to self-select. Um, but one of the things in volunteer management is if you have a volunteer who is really what we call other motivated, they're not there for the reason that everybody else is there, um, do you fire them? And can, you know, is that something that you have to deal with with open hiring? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If, um, we have a 10 point system, which is part of, you know, unions, they do have the manufacturing, it's very, it's very normal in the industry to have a, a point system of progressive discipline. Um, I think that's what they call that in the union. And um, so people have 10 points. So if people don't show up on time, if people are not, you know, it, it just depending on, you know, what really is the issue is, people might get a certain point and it depends on if there's a severity of the kind of issue of like attendance issues specifically, or they're not, you know, putting the pan where they're supposed to be, you know, following general manufacturing um, 
principal. So I think that is also part of that, right? That you kind of make sure that people understand what's expected of them. Because if you don't, then of course people aren't going to know, you know, the rules of what is expected in the workplace. So my my follow up to that has to do with um, is the onboarding is is that kind of like an on the job interview? I mean, is that what the onboarding process is like an on the job interview? No, the first um, the, I talked about the orientation. I assume the orientation is they immediately start going into this is what, you know sexual harassment training. This is um, what it work, what, what are the rules to work in a genuine manufacturing and. And they already signed HR paperwork um, and they start working within two days. So nope, definitely not. It's definitely as if you were starting your job on the first day and you're giving orientation and this is your work area. This is just, it's very like a normal work orientation. And a lot of times it's been people, if they decide not to be part of it, because even though Grayson has been in the community for a while, people still don't know what we do here. And so when they actually come here and walk around and look at the manufacturing facility because it is indeed a manufacturing facility rather than what it sounds like a small bakery and so the minute people really see what goes on there and the work that they're going to have to do that it is will work you know it's not for them that's okay so that's kind of that point of that orientation just to be honest about the type of work that they're going to be doing one last question before we go back <laughs> yeah, it's okay great um it has to do with do you do you bring in when you bring in a group of people are you bringing in more than you need because you expect people to self-select out like how do you handle the numbers i assume you have a certain number of people you need on the floor doing the work and if people are allowed to just not show up which they're going to do if they're not going to show up how do you yeah. manage the numbers yeah, so then our HR individuals, yes, they know just by experience that there is going to be a little bit, just like you said, that people are not going to show up. So they do manage that in, absolutely. But assuming even if, usually it comes to about 10, 10 or 11 or 12 people, but if all 12 people stay, if we still have, we can still keep all that. So that actually doesn't become a problem if people end up staying and it's a great sound. Because at the end of the day, they rather have people, you know, come and, and get started to work. So for health, we, we, we love that everyone stays, but we know that the reality is that, you know, at the end of the day, people choose not to be part of it. Elizabeth? Um, okay, so now the, Crystal wants to know, how do you address employees coming in that were termed out for good cause and that you really aren't comfortable bringing back? Do people come back and ask for a second chance after they've already had their first chance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it really depends on how egregious the behavior was, and there's records on that. So I would, uh, yeah, definitely, they, if there's something that was really egregious that they did at the workplace, then obviously they would not be welcomed back, probably, um, to my understanding, but I, I can double check on that. But um, for individuals, because a lot of times people just don't show up, for example, and they don't ever come back after probably two weeks then in that case, they would have the second, they just signed their name back on the list. So something, you know, very minor, like attendance issues, or they just didn't want to work anymore, and they never showed up, which in a probably normal workplace, they would not be welcomed back because of reliability issues, but we would definitely welcome people back. So something like that, because that's, you know, that's the whole point of that, you know, sometimes it's just not the right time for, you know, people to be at the workplace, and they have other obligations. That's terrific. Um, uh, now, Simone is asking, uh, is there inclusion among the leadership? Does the leadership look like the staff? I would, uh, I would say so. Um, it depends on what type of leadership. Grayson, we have the foundation and we have also the bakery staff. Um, I, no, not, not to get into specifics, but um, I mean, I would say that in general, yeah, I would say that they do, yeah. Um, so the next uh, question is from S S Choi, who wants to know, in the hybrid business structure, sale, brownie, revenues, money goes to hiring more people. It seems there is a limitation of hiring more people based on the amount of brownie sales. Um, do you get any government subsidies? And since in your financial balance statement, it shows losing money over time, how to maintain the business so I think, I don't know if I understand that question. Is that, um, 
what's really, yeah, I think I'd have to understand that question. So maybe next question. Yeah, I don't know if I understand that question. I, I think the question is, are you sustainable just by selling the product or are you also reliant on government funding to subsidize your workforce development efforts? Gotcha. So yes, yeah, so the bakery is absolutely 100% financially completely in, independent in that way. And so the foundation is completely different. And the foundation, Grayson Foundation, actually helps they have workforce development programs and that support the city of, and individuals who live in Yonkers in the community. So that is different and that is grant funded, which is different than the bakery, which the brownies and that all goes in a in a, in a, different, um, in a completely different legal structure. Okay, that's all the questions that we have so far. So if anybody else has a question, this is a good time to type them in. Um, so I'll jump in with some more questions. <laughs> sure. Um, with specifically helping, helping people who come in who have problems. I think this is one of the things people, every employer is looking for a reliable employee at whatever level they're at. And you know, you're hiring people that might have had drug addictions or current drug addictions or they've been in jail or whatever, how do you, your focus is on how to help people succeed as opposed to how to keep people, keep people out. But can you talk about the employee support functions that you do? Yeah, so um, part of the, right, the, re the reason why the model becomes, uh, in our view, successful is that we have these partnerships with community uh, partners, right? So one of the partnerships we have is one of the social um, so place social services in the community of Yonkers. And so we have a woman that's on staff. And so as a result of that, it's independence in the HR function and individuals feel more comfortable speaking to someone that isn't specifically HR. And so we think that this is this, this idea that maybe in terms of the innovative partnerships to help the workplace run a little bit better so that you're right, that the business focuses on running the business. And these other potential um, Things which again, I think it's akin to an employee assistance program. I think that's something that really that people understand and, and, and realize is probably something similar to that. So I think having those robust services with the partnerships of the community is something that um, is what makes it really successful. I think is that is that the question? Yes, Elizabeth. I think we got some more questions. Yep. Okay. So uh, Sanam wants to know, um, do you experience a high turnover as a result of your hiring practices? Um, I think we spoke about this earlier. So um, once people reach the apprenticeship and they're full-time employees, turnover is really low. It's about 15, 12 to 15%. It's been, it's been going, I think it's about 15% now. Okay. That's terrific. And do you happen to know what the standard turnover rate for a business is? Nope, I don't have, I don't know that standard, to be honest with you. Okay, I'll Google it. <laughs> um, and uh, Michael would like to know, um, what are your best recommendations to scale this model? And can you speak to the underlying spiritual motivation for Grayston and how this can or cannot be scaled? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, we personally do think it can scale. I think that's the reason for the Center for Open Hiring. Um, and when Mike Brady, he was, he's, now the, he's now the CEO, um, was running the bakery just as the general manager of the bakery, he was getting a lot of calls um, for, you know, I really want to develop this practice here at my company. Can you help me? But as you know, you have to run a bakery. And so this idea to create the center was to create a space and um, an ability to be able to share a lot of these practices. So that's what we're doing now at the Center for Hiring, is really understanding the process that, and why it's successful at the bakery. And that's why this is still a very, very, um, we have pilot partners who believe in this, they wanna be pioneers in this. And so that's why also that's been helping in terms of scaling this, we can understand what's working, what's resonating. And the minute we share actually the story of of what we're doing and how it could be that easy, assuming you have the right infrastructure in place to support um, this type of practice, then people actually find it in themselves to look at their own employ employment um, processes and practice and see how they can change it themselves, rather than us saying, you need to do this X, Y, and Z. Because we know that once people hear open hiring, they're gonna apply it probably a little bit differently, and that's okay. 
And the point of it is, is just more to look at the way that um, you're bringing people in and probably to eliminate some of those barriers. So um, uh, the, a lot of the history of it, and that's kind of why the practices was informed, was Zen Buddhist monk. And so as a result of being a lot into social justice, and Zen Buddhism is a very particular, very action oriented. Um, he wanted to really help the, um, the residents in Yonkers when he moved the bakery to, to Yonkers area and to really get people to work and say, how can we help people you know, find, um, you know, not only a home, there's a lot of homeless population was happening in the offers at the time, but also, uh, there was also a big AIDS population, so how can we really help this community, you know, in many ways thrive in providing a place where we don't, don't ask any questions, and we actually train them to be, to be workers, to be in, in community with each other, and I think that's been the interesting aspect that, especially at that time, he really wanted to meet people where they are, and so not to involve completely complicated trainings and you know very difficult and then complex systems which we now know in the workplace but at that time it's very much the same that we're keeping that is that why, why do we need to complicate things right and so once you just bring people in and train them to do the specific job and give them that chance and give them that support the emotional support if they need that then it really becomes um, amazing to see people how they really step up to that and really um, and thrive and flourish um, even here, in, and when I've left here at Grayson, I've called an Uber, and a few times I've, I've been picked up by a former Grayson employees, and employees who worked 15 years ago. And they speak really highly of Grayson and how they were really happy to be part of it. So I think that's also really interesting that they now started you know, to work on their own and, and really um, do other things in the community and seem really proud to be part of the, the Grayson community. Um, okay, I'm actually going to um, open it up for Michael. Um, do you want to have any follow-up questions, Michael, for Anne-Marie? I unmuted you. Oh, maybe you have to unmute. Oh, oh okay. So, no, I mean, uh, Anne-Marie was uh, gracious enough to, go to come to my class yesterday night. <laughs> and some of these, uh, I, I just wanted to mention that for also other people, that they were super, these are traditional MBAs, they were super excited. I just read their sort of comments. Uh, that this is even possible. So I think it's important to, to share that story uh, to some degree and do it as accurately as possible, clearly. Uh, I think that that scaling is really an interesting sort of process. And um, from that on, I'm just curious, what, what are sort of elements that we think or that you think can scale, what will not be scaling? And you mentioned a number of things that you are able to scale. Uh, globally now with going to the Netherlands and other things. And I, I, I don't know if I overheard this, but I think what's important possibly is to understand that this is part of a world-class um, uh, company. This is not just something that's a, a little pilot project, uh, maybe 33 years old, but this is really something that has reached a, a world-class quality standard that can be mimicked by others. Uh, and so I think um, it's just worth considering that yeah, yeah, you're right, Michael. That's a good point. So, um, given our needs and the the need to expansion in terms of uh, supporting Unilever and their European expansion, we're developing a bakery in the Netherlands. So, we're working closely with an um, organization called the Star Foundation, who do a lot of um, workforce and advocacy and really helping um, an alternative workforce find employment in the Netherlands. So, they are working to scale these ideas and concepts in the Dutch context. Um, throughout in the, the Netherlands, but also helping us support um, making sure open hiring is also in the bakery that will be built in, um, in the Netherlands as well. So absolutely right. And we also practice an aspect of this as well with um, Ben & Jerry's. They do, um, it, they call it values-led hiring, but because that's part of the way that they have, have marketed it as well, but they also practice this in Vermont as well, and they're looking to see if they can expand on it as well. And that's part of it. We're learning to realize that where people need to be coached, where we can probably provide support, where we can probably help create these partnerships with the community and help make it a valuable experience for individuals who are going to come in. Can I ask a question? Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I just, I wanted to ask a question. I just had this experience, uh, I think it was on the 10th of September, driving through uh, Wisconsin and listening to their public radio station and there was a program it was a national program national uh, talk show and it was all focused on a it started out as as some focus on a new project a new 
company, somebody who had this idea of really hiring all these women into and giving training and opportunities for jobs in the construction world, the outdoor uh, construction, roads, whatever. And the only thing that they were asked to do was to be able to, um, to show up and to be on time. <laughs> you know, wow. that was, I mean, that was, that was the beginning thing that, that was kind of a must do. And then they went into training. The talk show also included the woman who wrote many books about the working, working class and things like that in terms of uh, low pay, paying jobs. And uh, Nickel and Diming It was one of her um, books. But she was on it also. And the, at a national level, that, that conversation that developed because of people from all over the country kind of calling in and giving experience was one of the most fruitful things I've been a part of. I mean, I love, I love hearing this. I'm just wondering if a conversation like this could actually be taken onto a show like uh, NPR. And, and because I do think that there are some sister efforts or, you know, there are kindred spirits yeah. out there that are doing different things. And even if they're not exactly, they'll be very stimulated because they're leaning in that same direction to learn from each other as well as to really create among so many people. Uh, and I'm gonna try to um, find a link to that program and I'll, I'll be happy to send it out. Please send it. I think you're right. I think that's what this kind of bigger conversation of how to handle this, um, a lot of these different issues, and not only to solve social issues, but even you know low employee engagement and all these other different aspects that are happening in the workplace. We actually were also featured in NPR Marketplace without, again, it wasn't our, it was just, I think they were just talking about how companies need to start training people. And so one of the commentators said, yeah, I just read about uh, Grace and Bakery in a Business Insider article, and they give people an apprenticeship and just train people, and this is what companies really need to do. So I encourage you to look that up as well, that we were, in terms of, this is a, you know, a conversation that's being started about that we need to be providing people training. And um, yeah, I thought it was interesting, but I think that's related to that. But, that's part of the idea of the center to really see if we can also gather people together and open hiring should be viewed. And I, I will say that it's, and we also working um, with one of a, a pilots in Boston that's looking to, you know, really there's a population of veterans in that community and single mothers that they want to reach out to as well. So open hiring just means, you know, any barrier, right? And a lot of times we do have those barriers if you've been out of the workplace for a while. And so as, the concept as applied in Grayston and Yonkers specifically, you know, has been, you know, this, you know, the conversation of second chance or fair, you know, fair chance opportunity individuals. But at the end of the day, it could also mean individuals who have a disability and, you know, or have, you know, you know, again, um, a lack of work history. And they, the LBGT community, like communities who a lot of times don't get access to certain you know, opportunities because of a filtering process or, per, or potential discrimination in the process of being, being interviewed. Um, um, just real quick for, you know, workplace purposes, or I'm not using the right word. Anyways, for those of you who joined and are hoping to get continuing education credit from participating, um, now is the time we need you. If you want a certificate of completion for this you know, lunch and learn, please in the chat room, give us your full name, your email, and what sort of certificate of completion you want. Uh, we, this was approved uh, through my company, Humanist Learning System, um, as a partner for the International Humanistic Management Association. And I can offer an HRCI or SHRM certificate, or even a general one to you, but you need to put your name and your email and which certificates you want in the chat room. And then that's what we're gonna to use to issue those. So um, back to the questions, Elizabeth. So I wanted to share Leanne's comment um, because it, it builds on something that um, Anne-Marie just said. She says, it's a mindset shift from a control mentality of HR and employee management, which is hugely costly, to a model of trust and expectation of high standards which is less costly. Uh, research shows that only 2% of employees are intentionally dishonest. So spending all that money for controls in case people do something wrong is wasted money. 
That's an amazing comment. Um, if we could send that, yeah, I would love to. That's exactly the case. And I think Dr. Pearson can speak uh, even more specific in a research space. And that's kind of the point of the center. I am very new here as well, only from the beginning of the year. And the point is to find a lot of that research. And so part of this education and training piece of the center is to start to build out training, not only for the human resources individuals, but the executives to build out a strong business case, which is part of that, but also I would say the legal case, right? And so we're working with students at Penn Law um, and faculty members, but also looking at other legal um, partnerships that also can help us build that case. Because a lot of times the case law that's involved in these type of issues, if you're, of course, you need to provide a, a, you know, and protect your employees at the workplace, but a lot of the issues related to that, you know, probably won't actually be applicable. And I think turning lawyers to realize that as well, which is also hard being a lawyer as well, Lawyers are very, they want to protect their client. And so um, a lot of times they won't even look at something if they, if they haven't been exposed to it in a different way. But there is a movement even among law, uh, conscious contracts, the integrative law movement has also been looking to how to really um, change the mind shift of lawyers as well. So that when the HR professional or the executive goes to the legal team, the legal says, yeah, let's see how we can work this out. Let's see how can we creatively look at this in a way to perhaps we just need to manage in a different way or have a different process at, at, the, at the back end rather than at the front end and see how we can really then bring value to our community at the same time. So I think that's really that value that um, as a human resource professional, thinking strategically of how to be create a diverse um, and inclusive workforce, but also um, corporate social responsibility um, and being really strategic of how bringing that community in, but also, you know, just, it's an interesting way that, and we're working on that to build a lot of those strategies so that we can give that to you in the training and you can really have those arguments to really advocate for a, a practice like this. Um, so I don't see any more questions right now. Um, Leanne did also mention a work on trust by Francis Fukuyama, who says that trust is the greatest asset a company has, had, has and um, that it also increases productivity significantly. Have you noticed any productivity differences with your staff compared to other bakeries? Have you tracked those metrics? We haven't checked those metrics. That is part of the center to do a little more research on these type of things because we know that people are going to start asking more of that. They didn't have the capabilities. Uh, again, that even the the foundation arm, which is looking to research, which is part of the center, is looking to research a lot of these aspects. That at the end of the day, they were just working on the bakery and getting production out. So this is this new piece of how to you know track those m metrics of help people understand really you know how we're doing what we're doing and why it is so successful. But that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, and then Florian would like to know if the main goal is social justice, do you think it's better to have regular HR practices aimed specifically at hiring marginalized populations or open hiring? With open hiring, isn't there a risk that more educated, privileged people take the available spot since the selection is basically based on chance, uh, first come, first serve? So are we talking about entry level positions or higher level? I wonder about that. Um, she didn't specify. Let's just say with the entry level, since that's the the main focus for you. Yeah. So um, that's an interesting question. We haven't encountered that here. So I would again, if we have to do pilots, and that's something probably we would research. But here, that hasn't been um, an issue, obviously, and that's all we can I can speak of. It's kind of the experience we've been having in terms of um, this is not easy work. So if we, I think if someone wants to work there that has a, an educational opportunity, we have to remember that there is a list, and so whoever's first called on the list gets hired. So it's it's not um, that's something you need to remember. So there's whoever's next in line as well. So once if there's ten people on the list that are next in line, those are the ten people who are called, and they come in and they then just then decide if this is a workplace for them to be at, given the given the workplace expectations and the type of work that needs to be done. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Yes, I think it does. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm wondering about how do you um, tell your reporting story? Do you put out an impact report? Do you, you do, do you use any kind of social accounting where you're looking at other kinds of metrics besides financial, such as integrated reporting? Yeah, so they're developing a more robust impact measurement system. Our CFO is developing that, but um, now they are just measuring, and then we're, we're a B Corp um, as well, and we do those metrics as well. 
Um, but in terms of just those regular, you know, environmental and looking at, you know, numbers with that and looking at how many people sign on the list and how many people, you know, leave and the time they're leaving, that's something they are looking at in a more robust way and um, our impact measurement system that's in the works as well. Okay, that's all the questions that we have for now. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to talk about, Jennifer? Yeah, um, Michael, did you have something just now or? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of uh, make sure that the connection is made between this open hiring model and what we call humanistic management, which is sort of the protection of dignity and the promotion of well-being. And so this is, I think, one effort that is coming from maybe the, the hiring perspective in which you either restore dignity or you, you uh, enable uh, human dignity through the hiring and the, the work process uh, uh, itself. And I think that that can showcase in many ways uh, how you achieve a sense of personal control, well-being, and, and move up the, the kind of uh, personal flourishing ladder. And I just wanted to make sure that that is one aspect of, of humanistic management and that is requiring this mind shift that also Leanne was talking about in which way you trust and build or design for trust in organizing practices and others that I think are critical in our uh, well to understand to understand why our traditional top-down control models uh, don't do many of those things that we wish them to do in terms of protection of dignity and promotion of flourishing and so. I'd, I'd like to build on that michael by pointing out it's also a reciprocal process right because when we extend dignity to others we're also extending it to ourselves it's a mutually reinforcing process so the organization is also enhancing its own dignity and the, the people that are involved with it. Um, Anne-Marie, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think this is what I think the whole point, I think I hope for this, for this community of humanistic management network and, and the point of this be here to talk about open hiring is that for companies to be open to an edu more thorough education with our full staff here and individuals who have been doing it and we welcome them either to visit the Center for Open Hiring or that we're happy to go over there as well and to have a more thorough discussion um, with that. I think being open to the discussion and hearing about really what, um, what it entails, like a more in-depth level and being trained almost about that is something that I think that's all at the end of the day people hope to be open to rather than saying no there's no way we can do that and I think that's I think the promise of this is that to have you know people think differently about you know either how to bring people in or how to manage and and there's a, like you said there's a way to you know bring dignity on both sides and I think that's part of that you know being vulnerable a little bit and um, in a good way, right? Saying that we're going to try something, you know, a little bit um, non-traditional, but that's actually might be, um, it might be, you know, the future of how business works. Um, and Choi brings up a good point. Um, they want to know from employees' perspective, um, is there any demand, any request? Um, what, what does this process look like um, from their voice? Uh, in terms of that they have a full-time job and they love having a community, I think, I, yeah, yeah, curious. Uh, yeah, because so, there's been a lot of discussion about the company side uh, of, of perspective, but like, do you have a story of um, what, you know, you've heard from workers and, and how this experience has um, shifted their, their point of view or their, their well-being? Yep, absolutely. So I obviously can't be, there's no way I can tell all the many great stories. Our website, um, I think you definitely go to Grayston's uh, website and you can, there's so many stories there. There's also a beautiful TED Talk. I don't know if you guys were able to see that. Dion Drew is someone who has had an amazing story. There's a lot of women, uh, I, you can say, I don't know if they're all on the website or if I can say their names for the privacy concerns, but uh, now she started as, you know, entry level as in the, in the baker. Now she works for our quality assurance completely different, you know, department. So people do move up and move around and as a result of being able to have um, a different schedule as well in terms of because the bakery runs 24 hours a day that they do have that flexibility to go take care of their children in the community and we have we have those workarounds. And DeAndre, this is I think the really funny thing that he talks about is he's a supervisor at the bakery now as well. And he says, you know, we're so concerned about the employees, you know, that we actually ask, go around asking who needs, when, what days do they need off, which becomes almost difficult to manage rather than saying, this is the day you need to work. We want to be 
really thoughtful that we know in, in most individuals have children and they have other you know demands or they have um, parents that they're taking care of so we you know kind of that experience is helping them have you know the best experience they have when they are you know working here and that they can take the days off that they need but yeah there's actually a lot of stories of people and having on interviewed a lot of individuals as well and telling me how they've completely just been um, accepted into like a workplace or a community that you know that you know just been a really fun experience for them I think I think they tell their stories a lot better I and mean, there's definitely on the website and DeAndre also has a, a lot of great stories and DeAndre is funny he's actually was speaking at Dutch Design Week which I think is amazing that should tell the success of a lot of his stories and um, I think he was actually speaking at one of the UN events on Tuesday as well so I think that was that's really amazing I'd like to, we have about five minutes left, so what I'd like to do really quick before we do the last question is talk about our upcoming events at the International Humanistic Management Association. We do have two more uh, humanistic professional lunch and learns uh, set up. The next one in October 26 is on ethical wages and good jobs. The one in November has to do with employee motivation. And uh, there'll be more things coming up. We do have a PhD network. We have um, unnecessary conversations and other things. So do go to our website. The best way to know what's coming up next is to join our mailing list or even join our organization and become a member. Um, now on the question of ethical wages, one of the things you said early on, Henry, was you talked about what the starting wage was for people who start working with you. And it, it was actually pretty high. I think it's, it's definitely above the minimum minimum wage. So you, can you talk about the living wage aspect of this within Grayston? Um, at, specifically at the bakery, right. When, um, when after the apprenticeship is over and they become full-time employees is when, right, that, that analysis then kicks in that they have access to a social worker on staff, which, you know, that is a part of the cost, the health insurance and access you know, to life insurance. And their learning and development, that's also part of that cost. It's a very recent analysis that they recently did that we're having um, learning development training for individuals that if they do want to move on from Grayson, which people have expressed that, that they could obtain the business skills or any kind of certification so they can leave when they go to a workplace and say, look, this is a list of uh, trainings that I did at Grayson. And so they can kind of carry that on and kind of really be trained um, should they want to either stay here and just develop better skills or kind of move on. We also are developing an internship program as well, which one of the individuals at the bakery was interning here at the foundation. He wanted to do more office work. And so that was actually, he, he was really great actually. We had him here for a bit. Elizabeth or Michael, is there anything else you want to add? All right, well, I want to thank you, Anne-Marie, for joining us. Um, I thought this was a really great conversation and I think a lot of people are going to go back to their companies and go, okay, let's have this conversation about how we actually do our hiring and how we might think yeah. about hiring differently to help people come in and succeed as opposed to keeping people out. I think that's the big, the big shift. Is there any closing comments you want to make, Anne-Marie? Yeah, that I'm happy to engage that conversation with anyone. And we've um, even Timberland here was for a visit to, to do a community service project, but as virtue of just visiting our facilities and they want to have another conversation, I think, People, companies are looking around for um, options. Yeah, Warby Parker called us after the Fast Company article that was out there. And so people are interested in this. And I think that's what the work of the center is going to hopefully try to do is work with um, professionals, academic ones like Dr. Pearson to really build the knowledge base and or the, you know, they kind of bust a lot of these myths that people might have and then really work with individuals once they come in and, and really develop, you know, a workplace that at the end of the day, we want everyone to succeed, which I think is the essence of HR and that you want individuals and organizations to succeed. And so do we. So I think that that's a great, that's a great message. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us. And um, again, our next one is set up already for October 25th, uh, 26th on ethical wages and good jobs. And again, sign up for the mailing list and we'll see you there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jen.